I think people would feel more comfortable with expressing their views. So this is at the level of students, for example, in classrooms. If they get a, a more politically diverse professoriate. And then at the level of scholarship, I think the range of opinions that could be expressed would also increase if there was more of a balance. Christian Gonzalez here on Heterodox Out Loud. Today's episode is about how we treat our ideological adversaries and how responses to them often come down to a numbers game. I'm your host, Zach Rausch. Stay with us. Our guest is Christian Gonzalez, a PhD student in political theory at Georgetown University and a writing fellow at Heterodox Academy. We'll hear his argument that social power dynamics, the extent to which some groups are larger than others, can affect how individuals treat the other side. It's a disturbing story about power, privilege, and human nature. Before our interview, Christian's blog on social power dynamics in political discourse. The narrator is Richard Davies. In 2018, Amy Wax, a professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania, appeared on Glenn Lowry's YouTube show. Wax had ignited controversy when she declared that she rarely saw Black law students graduating near the top of their class at UPenn. Critics accused her of trafficking in racist stereotypes, arguing that such remarks were likely to make her black students uncomfortable in class. When Lowry asked Wax if she was repentant for her actions, she replied that she was not. Wax felt that nobody should have been offended by what she perceived to be her plain statements of fact. Wax's reaction is characteristic of what appears to be a conservative reluctance to understand why right-leaning views are so unwelcome on college campuses. While I am deeply concerned about the dearth of viewpoint diversity at our universities, I think the failure to understand the roots of leftist rage will only exacerbate polarization and make dialogue more difficult. I believe there are many factors behind the progressive hostility to conservative ideas, but I want to highlight two in particular. The first factor has to do with progressive beliefs themselves. The second, and perhaps more important one, has to do with social power dynamics. In The Righteous Mind, Jonathan Haidt argues that progressives are primarily motivated by the desire to help victims of oppression. Most causes of the left are thus conceptualized as problems between oppressors and oppressed. For instance, Israel as the oppressor of Palestine, men as the oppressors of women, and whites as the oppressors of other racial groups. Although this theoretical approach undoubtedly has its merits, analyzing problems in terms of oppression poses difficulties to the fostering of viewpoint diversity, because anyone who disagrees with leftist interpretations can easily be perceived to be making apologetics for oppression. Suppose that the four following axes of oppression exist. First, there is capitalist oppression. The billionaire class continues to augment its wealth at the expense of everyone else. Second, there is racial oppression, a legacy of slavery, Jim Crow, and other informal and undeclared means of discrimination continue to suppress black economic, political, and educational outcomes. Third, there is gender oppression. Misogyny prevents women from reaching the highest levels of political and economic power. Fourth, there is imperial oppression. The United States uses its enormous military to secure access to oil and other resources in the Middle East and elsewhere, frequently committing ghastly war crimes along the way. For a college student or professor who interprets oppression in this way, it's going to be very grating when a conservative comes along to say, for example, not just that capitalism isn't oppressive, but that poor people are the system's primary beneficiaries. Or 
that discrimination is not the reason why minorities are lagging behind whites, or that American foreign policy helps foster economic prosperity, international stability, and democratic freedom. Such conservative positions as these will appear as rationalizations, if not outright justifications, for what leftists perceive to be unequal structures of power and subjugation. On this basis, then, one might think that leftist frustration is incurred because they either, one, believe that conservatives support evil systems, or two, believe that conservative positions will further entrench these systems to the detriment of society's most vulnerable people, even if conservatives do not personally have bad intentions. But such explanations for the frustration, I believe, only partially explain its origins. While many leftists are indeed upset by conservative positions for the two reasons I mentioned, the analysis of leftist intolerance for right-wing views is incomplete without an understanding of the social power dynamics that allow leftists to get away with hurling accusations to an extent unavailable to their rightist counterparts. Many conservatives, after all, believe that liberal policies hurt minorities and the poor in the same way that liberals believe conservative policies hurt those groups. For example, Jason Riley, a Wall Street Journal columnist, has argued that the welfare state makes blacks dependent on the government and thus hampers their economic opportunities. Most economic libertarians argue that government social programs are not improving the lives of the poor. Minimum wage increases, says the right, just price unskilled workers out of the labor market. Similarly, rent control makes housing unaffordable. Yet despite charging left-leaning policies with making disadvantaged people worse off, we rarely see right-wingers dismissed leftists as racist or classist in elite intellectual venues like universities, magazines, and newspapers. The asymmetry between how the left and right engage with each other in academia and print media, whereby the former can insult the latter with relative impunity, seems then to have more to do with the tactics available to each rather than with either side's principles. If the ratio of conservative to liberal professors was somehow reversed from roughly 1 to 10 to 10 to 1, I imagine that we would see vitriolic attacks within institutions of higher learning against Marxists, supporters of abortion, critics of U.S. foreign policy, and other scholars who took positions at odds with core conservative values. Put simply, leftists make accusations of racism or sexism partly because institutional power dynamics allow them to and partly to reinforce those very dynamics by discrediting others. Our society's necessary and justified revulsion to prejudice makes it such that accusations of racism can tarnish entire careers. If a scholar can be successfully branded as prejudiced, then she can be readily dismissed. And this is, in part, what such accusations aim to do, to dismiss rather than to engage. Conservatives, in turn, are forced to ask for the benefit of the doubt and to insist on the norms of civility because they tend to hold minority opinions in intellectual venues. If the right started slinging comparable insults at the left in universities or print media, it would be taken even less seriously than it already is. It appears, therefore, that when people engage each other in print or in debate, they make rhetorical decisions based on what the circumstances allow them. Apart from seeking to redress the imbalance of opinions in intellectual spaces, I'm not sure how we can overcome these social dynamics so as to improve the state of our discourse. Richard Davies reading Christian Gonzalez's blog on social power dynamics in political discourse. Christian joins us now. Thank you so much for coming on to Heterodox Out Loud. I've been a big fan of your work. You've written a bunch of blogs for us over the years. Just to start, for those 
in the heterodox community who don't know you, can you give a brief introduction to yourself and a little bit about what you study? I first started writing for Heterodox Academy when I was an undergrad at Columbia. And I studied political science and history. And now I'm in my second year of my PhD in political theory at Georgetown. And my research focuses on the history of the 18th and 19th centuries, especially in Britain, France, and the United States, and also on the political philosophy that was written at that time. Can you give a little bit more context to the blog? What got you thinking about the political dynamics on campus and relevant issues? So I wanted to explain why the left in the universities was stifling speech it didn't like. And I was unsatisfied with a common kind of explanation for it that conservatives would offer, which was that there was something about left-wing ideology that makes it sort of inherently anti-free speech. And what I wanted to suggest was that there's something about human nature and social dynamics, which makes it so that when you're an overwhelming majority in an institution, you're going to mistreat and marginalize people who who disagree with you. So I explained the stifling of speech among certain segments of the academic left by noting the fact that they have a lot more social power than conservatives and not emphasizing anything about the particular content of their ideology. I want to take this in like two different directions, but to start, I feel like maybe it's an obvious answer, but I feel like if you go to a university and there's a ratio of, let's just say it's like 10 to 1 of Christians and Jews, I feel like the vitriol is not there, even though there is an imbalance of ideology and religious background. But with politics, it's a whole other level of animosity that exists. And so what is it that's different about politics in the university and the disparities there versus disparities in other areas that maybe wouldn't have the same kind of impact? Yeah, that's a really good uh, point, actually. I would say, at least in kind of elite universities, on the whole, people's religious identity isn't really activated as much as their political identity. So... You know, if you're walking around, you might identify as Jewish or Christian, but it's not something that you sort of wear on your sleeve to the same degree as your politics. I think if it were as active an an identity, then you would get the same dynamic. So, like, if people really cared about how Christian they were and they outnumbered other religions 10 to 1, and people's Christian beliefs influenced the way they taught and the way they produced scholarship, then I think you would get the same sort of disdain for people who attacked Christianity, for example. So for the most part, I feel like this is true still in universities and mainstream outlets. But at least recently, I've personally gotten to notice that the language used by people on the right or more conservatives in some conservative outlets, and even now in some mainstream outlets like The Atlantic, New York Times, there's Conversations that tend to be around cancel culture, critical race theory, authors are accusing leftists now of being racist. And I am wondering if there's some sort of change in social power dynamics going on. And I was wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, I wonder. um, So John McCorder has a new book, I think, called Woke Racism. So, yeah, some people who are let's say, against academic identity politics are are kind of flipping the charge back against the dominant kind of view. I would say there's less of it than the other way around. I think it's reasonable to say if you look at the extent to which the racism charge gets thrown around in mainstream venues, if you spend some time on like the New York Times op-ed page, you'll get a lot more of that charge than if you do on like reading National Review, for instance. But there is, as you note, like this shift that some people like John McCorder is one example are making. But I would say even then, the sting of conservatives calling leftists racists is not the same. So, I mean, I struggle to think, with the exception of anti-Semitism, and that's a different discussion, but I struggle to think of an example where conservatives accused 
some author, for instance, of being of harboring anti-black racist prejudice and then managed to like cancel him in some way or or her. For instance, some people say that some of the things Ibram Kendi says are racist, but he still seems to be prominent and be doing well. So I don't think the social power dynamics have really shifted to get at your question. Right. The actual implications that come out of those accusations, are there's still a massive imbalance. I think you're right about that. At the end of your blog, you mentioned that you don't really know how to solve the issue of these disparities in social dynamics, other than maybe reducing the gap of political disparities. But you said this term of, like, we wear politics on our sleeves all the time now. And I'm just wondering if you had thought more about other solutions aside from minimizing the gap between the disparities of how many leftists, how many conservatives are on campus, and if there are other ways to mitigate these issues. I guess I have thought more about it, but If anything, I've become firmer in my belief that the only way is to shift the social power dynamics so that people who lean left don't so overwhelmingly outnumber people who don't lean left. And that comes out of, for instance, studying a lot of intellectual history and noticing that any time there is an overwhelming majority of a certain ideology in a profession, in an academic profession, you get these like kind of unhealthy dynamics. The example comes from Peter Novick's book, That Noble Dream, which is a history of academic history in the United States. So it's a history of history departments. And in the early 20th century, one of the things that comes out from this book is that actually Christians were this sort of dominant orthodoxy in academic history departments. And some places, like some universities actually required basically mission statements before they hired historians saying, how will your historical scholarship promote the word of Christ? And how will you manifest Christian values in your work? And if you didn't, then you were sort of not welcome. And John Stuart Mill also talks about this in his essay on liberty. He talks about how anytime someone has a minority, like a small minority opinion, they are subject to this kind of disdain and so on. We need a sort of balance of power. Anytime you get 90% Plus, it will be bad (laughs) of an ideology dominating. So we need to fix that. And that's what's going to solve it, in my opinion. So do you think the solution in in your mind is some sort of conservative affirmative action? Or is there a different approach that you have? Yes, I'm skeptical of uh, affirmative action for conservatives. This is a long conversation of, you know, sort of what is to be done. But the first thing I would say is that there has to be a sort of long-term thinking about the shifts in academic thinking and the way academia operates generally don't happen overnight. For the institution to change, I do think conservatives need to gain a foothold. I wouldn't want conservatives to be 90% either. I wouldn't want to reverse the situation. I think conservatives and people who are sympathetic to heterodox academy, which isn't only conservative, should start thinking about how they will get that foothold. I don't want like affirmative action now, but I would want projects that support people who are like not far left, at least not part of the dominant orthodoxy and promoting their scholarship and their work so that eventually we can get some sort of balance. Can you talk about why it increases academic freedom and what are the benefits that come with making those changes? One is I think people would feel more comfortable with expressing their views. So this is at the level of students, for example, in classrooms. If they get a a more politically diverse professoriate. And then at the level of scholarship, I think the range of opinions that could be expressed would also increase if there was more of a balance. The benefits would be both at the level of teaching and at the level of scholarship. What do you want to make sure that when people read your work, this essay, What do you want to make sure that people are coming away with? To some degree, I'm saying like I'm speaking to people on the right who are like really hostile to everything about the left. And I'm saying, well, you know, maybe don't be so harsh. If you had that sort of power, you would probably be doing the same. And the other is just thinking what I mentioned previously, thinking about how the real issue is to solve the social power imbalance. And that's going to require long term thinking. Thank you so much, Christian. It was great to talk to you. No, you're so welcome. Christian Gonzalez on Heterodox Out Loud. 
If you want to read more of his blogs, go to heterodoxacademy.org slash blog and stay up to date with Heterodox Academy's essays, resources, research, and events at our website. You're listening to Heterodox Out Loud. Subscribe and download us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Davies Content produced this show. I'm Zach Rausch. Until next time.